uh, you're ready, Sean? Uh, with with, ready with that, uh, uh, if you're Sean, on uh, the EU and the, uh, the changes it's made to the, constitu to the British Constitution. Yes. Well, thank you, David, for your introduction, and um, thank you, everyone, for turning out on what I'm sure we can all agree is a very sad and memorable day um, to, to listen to me. B before I begin, indeed, while I'm still warming my voice up, um, I'll draw your attention to the numerous copies of books that I've set before me. Yeah, it did no problem. But I'll, I'll draw your attention to the various books that are before me. Um, these ones here, a rather interesting novel that I wrote many years ago, I am contractually um, forbidden from selling, uh, but I can still give them away. And so if anyone would like to take a copy, please feel free to do so. Um, these books, very interesting books, some of them published in the past year, are all available at full price, and I shall be delighted to sign them for you. Uh, these books here, and this is only a selection of the ones that have so far been written by Mr. Blake, um, are, are all available, and I have full authority to sign them on his behalf for anyone who may be inclined to buy a copy. Uh, that being said, let me begin. Now, although we may disagree whether the words right and left have any meaning at all, especially any meaning in the modern world, one of the defining characteristics of those of us who are sociologically speaking on the right is a bitter hatred of the European Union. Uh, we, we may disagree over the speed with, with which we should dismantle the state. Many of us, or, or, many of us um, may not actually be that fond of the legalization of drugs. I'm thinking particularly of David Marsland, who is undoubtedly one of us. But something that unites libertarians and conservatives of most varieties is a dislike of the European Union. And this is one of the tests of orthodoxy which I did, in which I played some small part in um, establishing as the orthodoxy. So I'll just wait for a moment. Yes. Sorry, forgive me. Yes. I, I, I had some small part of my own to play in establishing the dislike of the European Union as part of our defining orthodoxy. I will not say that I've changed my mind about the European Union, but um, it, it, it is difficult to talk about any development taking place in a reasonably free country over several generations which has not produced at least one or two collateral advantages. And what I want to talk about after a rather long introduction is the collateral advantages that flow from our membership of the European Union. Now, before I, be, before I go into my main flow, let, let me explain what it is that a rational libertarian and a rational conservative should dislike about the European Union. It, it is not the case that these beastly frogs and dagos and krauts are all conspiring to drag us down to their own degraded level. Th that is not the function of the European Union. Th that is not how anyone regards it as, that is not how anyone would regard the defining purpose of the European Union. What I dislike about the European Union is this. The European Union, properly speaking, has no power whatever in this country. Uh, power, power comes ultimately from the barrel of a gun. The European Union has no guns. The British state has a large number of guns. Th therefore, to say that the British state's hands are bound by European law is a myth. 
the European Union can do nothing. It can exhort, it can nag, it can attempt to fine, it can send out orders which may or may not be obeyed. This is the case with regard to the British, to the British state and the European Union and to all the other member states and the European Union. Um, if you take something like the European arrest warrant, this does not apply in Germany because part of the German constitution is the immunity of residents in Germany from extradition to anywhere else in the world and therefore the German state has not implemented the European arrest warrant. The common fisheries policy is semi-applied in Spain but it isn't applied uh, and we well know that that is the case. And, and so if a British politician stands up and says we have no choice but to kill every second child in the country. Uh, the European law requires it. You can be quite sure that he's lying through his teeth. The European Union does not compel anything. The European Union is properly seen uh, an enabling excuse for the various ruling classes of the member states. And it works in this way. And let me give you an example which, um, I, which I have followed through from its inception to its latest implementations. In the mid-1980s, a number of government and business interests in Britain and in the United States uh, prodded the United Nations to, to get together and to, um, and to ratify something called the Vienna Convention on the Trade in Narcotics. And part of this was just a tightening of the usual beastly drug laws, but another part of it, by far the most important part of it, was the beginning of the worldwide money laundering laws. And, and so British and American business and uh, semi-government and government interests got together, uh, got this convention signed, and then went around the world getting it ratified. And it found its way into Europe as a Council of Europe directive. This then was transformed, without any change of wording, into a directive of what was then the European Community. And it then, in 1991, turned up in Britain as a European directive, which the government had no choice but to enact, virtually unaltered, into British law. And I remember complaining at the 1991 Conservative Party conference about this, uh, about the money laundering uh, laws that were coming in. And I was told by William Waldegrave, well, I'm sorry, but you know, this is something that has come down uh, from Europe. We really have no choice but to implement these things. This is not a policy of the British government. It, it, it is simply an inevitable aspect of our membership of the European community which was another reason why, in those far-off days, I disliked the European community. But this is frequently how power is exercised. What happens is that the British ruling authorities, the British ruling class, let's call it, decides to do something which may be rather controversial in this country, and so it goes off to Brussels, and from the various meetings, um, an order emerges which the British state then enacts into law by a rubber stamping process. And the British politicians can then hold up their hands and say, look, our hands are clean. This is nothing to do with us. This is simply Europe. It is an enabling device. What the European Union does is to free our ruling class from the inconvenience of holding itself accountable before the normal constitutional authorities in this country. If the Europeans decide on something which the British state does not like, either it doesn't happen because the British state is a very important part of the European Union, or, <coughs> pardon me, or it will not be properly implemented in this country. Um, it's as simple as that. And that, I think, is the whole case against the European Union. It, 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 it may have 
various functionaries in the European Union may, may have various um, super-state ambitions. It, it may want to have a European army. It may have a European anthem. It may have a European central bank. But the European Union, properly speaking, is a fig leaf. It is a fig leaf behind which the ruling classes in the various member states exercise unaccountable power over their people. And the moment it becomes seriously inconvenient for the ruling classes to use that particular fig leaf, they will simply find another one. And now let me come to the collateral advantages for us, the people of this fig leaf. Um, I think the best way to explain this is, 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 to, is to insist that um, one of the normal Eurosceptic claims about this country is false. One of the claims that you'll see in meetings of Eurosceptics is that Britain or England is the classic home of civil liberty and that our matchless free constitution has been depressed during the past generation or so by the European Union. But as soon as we are out, whether through the referendum, which may or may not happen in 2018, or, or through a unilateral repudiation of the relevant treaties, as soon as we are out, with a bound we shall be free and we can become we can become a country where the rule of law is honoured in every jot and tittle and where taxes will steadily fall back towards 5% and in which Britannia will rule the waves again, perhaps. Uh, the, the only thing that is stopping us from becoming as free as our nature requires us to is membership of the European Union. Oh, we may need to, uh, we, we may need to call a number of politicians to account once we are out. There will be a transitional phase while we uh, dispose of the uh, various European laws which exist as Acts of Parliament. But the general assumption is that the only thing this country really needs to get back on its feet is to leave the European Union. I, I don't think that is the case. <clears throat> I think the truth is that this country is so radically degraded in its political and cultural environment that, um, to, to some extent, leaving the European Union would make things very much worse than they already are. We really have come to the point where the only thing that keeps us moderately free, the only thing that keeps the authorities moderately under control, is our membership of the European Union. Now, now there may be a contradiction in that. I've said that the European Union is a fig leaf, and then I've said that it is also a shield. Well, which is it? And the answer is it's both. Um, but let me explain. The development of the British state over the past 200 years has been a movement from, an, from a highly conservative aristocratic state towards a politically correct managerial state. And there was no sudden break in which one constitutional order gave way to another. It was a long process of evolution. Um, in which until recently very few people could say what its final shape would be. Indeed, you could take a longer term view and say that we still do not know what the final shape is of the British state. Um, from the 1870s onwards, or perhaps from the 1830s onwards, you choose your date, the old aristocratic order began to pass away, began to be replaced. Uh, by a much more rational and um, administratively convenient set of structures. In many cases, far more humane, far less exercise of the death penalty, uh, far more rational in its drafting and implementation of laws. But we, we moved gradually from an aristocratic state towards a managerial state, in which power was no longer exercised by a committee of hereditary landlords, 
but instead by various coalitions of professional and semi-professional interest groups. Doctors, teachers, administrators, of course, uh, mustn't forget the civil service, um, journalists, and various other persons um, with professional or educational expertise. Now, during the early part of the 20th century, this managerial state was still highly liberal in its assumptions, to some extent. It was also highly nationalist in its assumptions, to some extent. We had a kind of liberal nationalist managerial state in England between about 1920 and about 1970. Obviously, that's a long period. It's a 50-year period, which takes in a world war and various other developments. But um, you can see a certain continuity of interest during that period. Since about 1970, and again, it's difficult to think of a cut-off date, but since about 1970, we have been moving away from a liberal, nationalist, managerial state towards a politically correct, totalitarian, managerial state. Why we're doing that, that takes me outside the scope of this evening's talk. But it is quite obvious that um, this movement has occurred. You may disagree about the, my longer term view of uh, the development of the British state, but undoubtedly since the 1970s that there has been an intensification of um, the police state. There has been um, a rise of political correctness which has been manifested in our laws. And we have now reached the point where it is often difficult to say whether this country is free or soft totalitarian or hard totalitarian. It's very difficult to know exactly the, the current state of affairs in this country. It, it depends, it, it varies from case to case, but you know, there is no doubt that the country is considerably less free today in most respects than it was in about 1970. Uh, of course, if you're gay and the, uh, m the main interest in your life is having lots of gay sex, you may disagree. If you like taking lots of drugs, uh, undoubtedly there is effectively a more liberal environment today than there was in 1970. But uh, if you're a property owner, if you like shooting, if you like the, if you like the idea of bringing your children up in your own values, or if you simply want to, um, if you simply want to publish things about politics, then undoubtedly this is a much less free country. Resistance to the growth of a managerial police state. Not much from us, not much from the Conservatives, not much from anyone on you know, what can be called in sociological terms the right. We have been completely ineffective. Um, 33, 34 years ago now, I, I really thought that um, by running around for a whole month stuffing, stuffing letterboxes for some putrid barrister, I, I was helping to bring on the libertarian counter-revolution, but um, I, I don't think that anyone would argue that that is what the election of Margaret Thatcher brought about. Um, you know, really, we have been utterly ineffective at opposing anything. The only real opposition to the police state in which we live has come from within the establishment, from within the ruling class. And the main opposition has not come from left-wing journalists or other people of that kind. It has come from the judges. The judges are not perfect. You only have to mention the McPherson report, the Levinson report, and all the others to know that the judges are not closet liberals of any kind. And um, when you look at people like uh, Lord Justice Hoffman, he of uh, Pinochet fame, you, you see people who, of course, have their own 
ideological interests which may not be particularly liberal. <clears throat> but the reason why the judges have been um, objectively on the side of liberty during much of the past century is because a managerial state of whatever kind requires a great deal of freedom in the way it gives its commands. It, it, it is extremely inconvenient to run any kind of managerial state um, by due process of law. You, you need a large number of tribunals to decide whether somebody is or is not entitled to this particular benefit, to decide whether this piece of property shall be um, acquired by compulsory purchase, to decide whether somebody can or cannot sell this particular kind of digital camera, and so on and so forth. Or perhaps you don't need so many tribunals, you need a, lot, you need a great deal of simple administrative discretion in which officials shall be enabled to say yes or no without too much delay. And although you may decide to regulate the uh, conduct of officials but by allowing appeals to a tribunal, you, you do not want too much due process in the way that those tribunals reach their decisions and you do not want endless appeals from those tribunals into the higher courts. And so whether the British state has been liberal nationalist managerial or politically correct totalitarian managerial, it has during the past hundred years repeatedly run up against resistance from the judges who do, uh, for obvious reasons, like due process of law uh, and who do like the idea of a constitutional order in which they are, if not supreme, then at least very highly honoured. A, a position which has not, on the whole, been offered by a pure managerial state. Now, again, one of the, um, one of the claims made by the <clears throat> less sophisticated Eurosceptic is that Parliament is sovereign. Parliament is sovereign in two senses. It can make or unmake any law it pleases, and it also cannot bind its successors. And so Parliament is absolutely sovereign. And the courts over the past hundred years have given a certain amount, <clears throat> I mean, the courts have given a certain amount of support to that proposition. For example, in the case of Cheney against Conn, 1968, uh, you have the judgment, statute is the law which prevails over every other form of law, and it is not for the court to say that a parliamentary enactment, the highest law in this country, is illegal. Th th there is a there is a long series of judicial decisions during the 19th and 20th centuries in which the courts have asserted that Parliament is absolutely sovereign and that it cannot in any sense bind itself and that no external power can bind it. And many Eurosceptics have taken a perverse delight in exploring uh, this proposition. Now, in the late 19th century, when Parliament was dominated, as I said, by a committee of hereditary landlords who, who were restrained by considerations of honour or, or simply of class interest from, uh, from um, taking full advantage of absolute legislative sovereignty, it was an interesting, but not in practical terms, very important consideration that Parliament could indeed do anything it liked. However, we now live in a world, and have lived in a world for some time, where Parliament is filled with villains. Villains and degenerates. We have now reached the point where if any member of Parliament stands before us, we can tell him 
that the presumption, the natural presumption is that he's in Parliament for the sex or the money or both, and that whatever protestations he, makes, he may make to the contrary, he is under a continuing presumption of guilt, which he must rebut every day, not only in his words, in fact, not at all in his words, but in his actions. I know that during the past 35 years that I've been in this movement, I've had Tory boys coming up to me every so often to say, oh, you know, Mr. John Bufton, you know, he's one of us, he's absolutely sound. Yes, absolutely sound, until I notice that he's um, speaking in favour of uh, you know, the repeal of Article 39 of Magna Carta, or something awful. I was told, I, I was, someone swore blind to me 20 odd years ago that um, Oliver Letwin was the nearest thing we had to a libertarian I in politics in this country. Well, I'm still waiting. I remember there was someone whose name I've just forgotten, it doesn't matter. Um, he was cried up in the 1980s as something like um, a British Ron Paul, though Ron Paul wasn't known in the 80s in this country. Uh, he was the person who would lead the next generation of conservatives in, into the promised land of libertarian utopia. Yes, yes. And then he introduced a private member's bill which would make the owners of clubs criminally liable for anyone who sold or consumed drugs in the street outside. Um, I know about this because Chris Tame was engaged to take a number of bribes to members of the House of Lords to talk this bill out in a filibuster. Uh, the bribe was never delivered. I don't think the filibuster uh, was ever given in the House of Lords. I, I think the bill simply ran out of time. But uh, this is the kind of person that we have been latching on to for the past 35 years. And so nowadays, if someone points to a Conservative Member of Parliament and says, oh, Sean, you know, that's, the name, you know, that, that's the British Ron Paul, that is. Well, you know, I, I'll believe it when I see it. The presumption is these people are villains. They're in it for the sex or the money, or worse than that, they might be in it for the sheer joy, the almost sexual thrill some people get from the, the, the idea of pressing a button and watching everyone jump at the same time. <laughs> now, those are the people who get into Parliament. Do you really want your life, liberty and property to be um, subject to the whims of these people without any hope of appeal. Do you really want to live in a country with an absolutely sovereign legislature, which could, if it so chose, have you dragged from your house and clubbed to death in the street? I don't want to. I want to live in a country with some kind of constitutional restraint. And although there have been a large number of legal decisions during the past hundred years which um, support the proposition that Parliament is absolutely supreme in that sense. There has also been a great deal of legal discontent with the proposition of parliamentary supremacy. Um, I won't go through the growth of judicial review. I do give quite a nice lecture on the growth of judicial review, but um, it takes us far away from where I want to be. Let me just say this. For about 40 years now, the judges have been waiting for an opportunity to mug the executive and the legislature. The judges have not liked the way in which the politicians have been making laws which are in flat defiance of the normal requirements of due process or which are simply grossly illiberal. The judges have been waiting their time. The sovereignty of Parliament is to a large extent a doctrine of the common law and the judges interpret the common law, and the judges can, the judges made Parliament, and the judges can knock it down. And that is what they're doing. And they, they delivered the first hammer blow um, 11 years ago. 
the metric master case, Thorburn against Sunderland City Council, etc. Um, is everyone familiar with that case? Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll go briefly through the facts. Steve Thorburn, actually the facts are not important. <laughs> no, the facts are not important. <clears throat> this is what happened. In, under the European Communities Act 1972, all European legislation has effect in this country. And it's given effect by various kinds of delegated legislation, not by Acts of Parliament, but by orders in council, by statutory instruments, and so on. These are orders made by ministers which are subordinate to Acts of Parliament. Now, in 1989, the European Union issued a directive on common on the harmonization of weights and measurements throughout the European communities, it was called then. The idea was that any good, all goods which were likely to be traded across borders, should be marked in a single system of weights and measurements, i.e. the metric system. And so if you are, if you're a factory making bags of sugar, which will be sold all over the European Union, uh, you, you need to mark those in kilograms or w what other measurement is suitable for sugar or for orange juice or wine or whatever, whatever it else you're packaging. There is no requirement that um, subordinate units should not also be given and there is absolutely no requirement that goods which are likely to be traded only within a particular country should be marked in metric measurements. None whatever. However, in 1995, the British government um, brought out some statutory instruments which required the whole country to go metric as of the 1st of January 2000. This was a Conservative government, and the law came into effect under a Labour government. The European Commission protested at the time, and has been feebly protesting ever since, that it did not command the compulsory metrication of England. Mm -hmm. The European Commission did not, at any point, uh, require the British state to make it a criminal offence to sell a pound of bananas in a street market. This is uh, a measure of the British state which it wanted to do for various other reasons, and for which it used the European Union as a fig leaf. I, I suspect that the big supermarkets had a hand in this because um, it's one of those ways in which big business can hobble smaller competition uh, by, by, the, by bringing in these endless regulations. Now, Steve Thorburn, a market trader, sold a pound of bananas in front of the trading standards people from Sunderland City Council and was prosecuted and convicted, took his appeal into a Crown Court, lost it, went into the Court of Appeal. And his argument was that the metrication orders from 1995 were invalid. They were invalid because the Weights and Measures Act of 1985 specifically said that pounds, ounces, gallons, etc., etc., were legal for all purposes in this country. Now, the Weights and Measures Act was passed in 1985. The metrication directives were made in 1995 but they were made pursuant to the European Communities Act, which was passed in 1972. And Steve Thorburn's lawyers argued that um, because the Weights and Measures Act, the Weights and Measurements Act was passed after the European Communities Act, the uh, European Communities Act had to some extent been repealed by a later Act of Parliament. Uh, and therefore, the metrication, direct, the metrication orders were invalid, uh, and indeed, to some extent, the country was already out of the European Union. We were in the European Union for some purposes, we were outside the European Union for other purposes, because the Act of Parliament 
which gave effect to our, to our signing of the Treaty of Rome had been impliedly repealed. The lawyers for Steve Thorburn, good Eurosceptics for a man, their argument was utter trash, I thought. I followed the arguments with close attention. The, the arguments for the state were also uh, feeble. Uh, but although the custom in this country is for judges to base their decisions entirely on the arguments given to them by counsel, there is an inherent power under the common law for judges to give decisions of their own motion. That is, the judges are at full liberty to ignore everything that has been said to them during the submissions of counsel and to reach a decision based on their own understanding of the law. And this is what happened. The Court of Appeal ignored the arguments set before it. And uh, let me quote from the judgment of Lord Laws. In the present state of its maturity, the common law has come to recognize that there exist rights which should properly be classed as constitutional or fundamental. And from this, a further insight follows. We should recognize a hierarchy of acts of parliament, as it were, ordinary statutes and constitutional statutes. The two categories must be distinguished on a principal basis. In my opinion, a constitutional statute is one which A, conditions the legal relationship between citizen and state in some general overarching manner, or B, enlarges or diminishes the scope of what we would now regard as fundamental constitutional rights. A and B are of necessity closely related. It is difficult to think of an instance of A that is not also an instance of B. The special status of constitutional statutes follows the special status of constitutional rights. Examples are the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights 1689, the Acts of Union, the Reform Acts, which distributed and enlarged the franchise, the Human Rights Act, etc. So ordinary statutes may be impliedly repealed. Constitutional statutes may not. A constitutional statute can only be repealed or amended in a way which significantly affects, sorry, can only be repealed or amended in a way which significantly affects its provisions touching fundamental rights or otherwise the relations between citizen and state by unambiguous words on the face of the later statute. Now, what the Lord Chief Justice said in that judgment is that, well, sorry, what he, what he worked in that judgment was a legal revolution, a constitutional revolution. The, the accepted doctrine before 2002, before this judgment, was that all acts of parliament were absolutely equal and if you get a majority of one, of one drunken, of one drunken degenerate in the House of Commons at two in the morning, you could repeal the Habeas Corpus Act, or, or, or you could pass a law chopping the right hand off every red-headed man in the country. What Lord, what Lord Justice Wolf said, sorry, what Lord Laws said, forgive me, is that we have a hierarchy of acts. And those acts which the judges regard as constitutional can be repealed by Parliament, but the politicians have to look us in the face and say, we're turning you into slaves, we are. They can't just bury um, an implied repeal of Magna Carta I into uh, the schedule of a local government act. They can't do that anymore. Any implied repeal of a, fundamental, of a fundamental law must be explicitly achieved by Parliament. Um, in future, the politicians will have to put it in black and white, and we are repealing section, we are repealing Article 39 of the Magna Carta. 
oh, and we are repealing habeas corpus, and we are repealing this, that, and the other. Anything less than that, and the judges will insist that it is an implied repeal of a constitutional statute, and as such is invalid. Now, now that, as I said, is a constitutional revolution. It suddenly meant that the politicians were no longer able to take our freedoms away in the way that they had been doing for at least a hundred years. Indeed, the logical consequence of that judgment is that I should be able to buy a revolver and refuse to license it and refuse to give it up to the police on the grounds that all the Firearms Acts have not mentioned any repeal of the article in the Bill of Rights which gives the right to Protestants to defend themselves according to their, um, according to their needs. Um, we do have a Bill of Rights in this country. It's not as explicit as the American one, but it is still pretty explicit. And the Firearms Act, which took away, which took away our guns, do not explicitly repeal the Bill of Rights. And so, in theory, the Firearms Acts could be regarded as null and void under that judgment of uh, Lord Laws. Now, um, that, that isn't the... The special significance of this and its connection with the European Union is this. The judges had been waiting for their opportunity to mug the other branches of the British state. And this was their absolute cast iron bulletproof way of getting what they wanted. What was, what was going to happen? Sorry, the judges suddenly slapped the politicians down and said, you're no longer sovereign or your sovereignty has been considerably limited. Now go away. What were they going to do? Was the Speaker of the House of Commons going to turn up in the Court of Appeal threatening the judges with arrest for contempt of Parliament? No, of course not. He had got the government off the hook. The government managed to win its case against Steve Thorburn. Uh, the European Communities Act 1972 was not repealed. It had been saved. And there was no other way in which it could have been done, because under the old rules, the European Communities Act had indeed been impliedly repealed by the Weights and Measurements Act 1985. And Lord Laws and the other judges who sat on that case, they had saved the government from enormous political and diplomatic embarrassment. And so there was no way that the politicians would stand up and say, this is an unacceptable interference with the, um, with the constitutional authority of Parliament. They swallowed it. The judges gave with one hand and took with the other. Indeed, the judges took a great deal more than they gave. It was um, a, a rather Shylocky judgment. The politicians were, the politicians were got off the hook once, in return for which they lost their right to enslave us in the dark. And it hasn't ended there. Following on from that, uh, the Countryside Alliance took the government to court in 2003, I think it was, claiming that um, there was a procedural irregularity in the passing of the hunting ban. Uh, again, the Court of Appeal, um, the Court of Appeal upheld the government, uh, upheld the government's case. But in the course of the judgment, the judges said that all legislate, all parliamentary legislation that is passed because of the Parliament Act is delegated legislation. Primary legislation is, an act, is a bill which goes through the Commons, the Lords, and then to royal assent. Um, using the Parliament Act machinery set up in 1911 and 1949 produces an inferior status of act. It is, a, it is delegated legislation. And this may, be, this may be struck down as invalid or unconstitutional by the courts if they so please. 
that the courts cannot strike down a primary act of parliament because that is an act of the sovereign legislature. But as soon as the machinery of the parliament acts is used, the product is an inferior kind of legislation which is subject to full judicial review. Um, moving forward from that, in 2005, the Blair government was trying to um, the, the Blair government tried to amend appeals the, the appellate structure of the immigration tribunals to cut down on the endless appeals from decisions of the immigration um, tribunals. And um, never mind what you think about um, unlimited immigration via the asylum process, the point is that the government, the government draftsmen thought they had found a judge-proof way of stopping judicial interference or any kind of judicial review of executive action with regard to asylum cases. And uh, the Lord Chief Justice stood up in the House of Lords and laughed at the politicians. He said, oh, you think that you've made this act judge-proof. Well, you just try it. We will, we will ignore, we will ignore the act. And faced with that challenge, which was supported by the other judges in the House of Lords, the government backed down and removed that particular clause from the um, relevant bill. Now, I, I repeat, I would not say that the judges in this country are clean liberals whom we should support with, uh, with unlimited enthusiasm. The judges are not that. But at the same time, the judges do believe in due process of law and that they also have a certain attachment to various constitutional liberties. At the very least, they like things to be done by the book. And what the judges have been doing during the past generation is to use our membership of the European Union to dismantle the doctrine of absolute legislative sovereignty of Parliament. And the main threat to life, liberty and property in this country is not from fuddy-duddy judges who let Abdul Ben Bulbul loose on the streets to paint Rissin on, um, on people's front door handles. It's not the European Union which is making all those wicked laws about the minimum size of vacuum cleaner bags. The main threat to life, liberty and property in this country is the British state. And it is those parts of the British state which are controlled by the elected politicians. And anything which reduces the power and effectiveness of these people is to be supported. The judges are to be supported in their long-term project of putting an end to the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. And I suggest that the European Union is pragmatically to be supported so far as, member, as, so far as our membership of that organization enables the judges to work their constitutional revolution against Parliament and the elected politicians. Indeed, I'd go further than that. Does anyone remember the Colngate case? No? Oh, in the Colngate against HM Commissioners of Customs and Excise, the Customs Consolidation Act 1876, this is one that the campaign against censorship has always been strong on, um, the Customs Consolidation Act 1876 gives the Customs and Excise the right to um, impound obscene or indecent items which, um, which come into the country. Uh, and this power was widely used all through the 20th century to stop people from bringing porn in. Um, at the moment, I'm being given ream after ream of the papers of David Webb. And there's all these um, 
all these interesting forms given him by the customs excise. This video cassette contains scenes of buggery, analinctus, fellatio, uh, and it goes down with tick, 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 tick. Therefore, it is um, confiscated. Well, that was the Customs Consolidation Act, 1876. Well, in the late 1980s, a British company, Combegate, um, imported a number of blow-up rubber sex dolls from Denmark. And these, of course, were impounded by the Customs and Excise, saying, oh, Customs Consolidation Act, these are obscene or indecent articles, can't bring them into our Christian country, no, no. Well, uh, it ended up in the courts, went all the way to um, the... It went all the way to Strasbourg, not the European Court of Human Rights, the European Court, the European Union's Supreme Court. And uh, the British state argued, well, you know, the, Europe, the Treaty of Rome says that we can, um, we, can, we can forbid the importation of... We can forbid the free movement of items if, um, if they're immoral. And the European judges said, yes, of course you can. It's just that uh, since it's not illegal to manufacture and sell blow-up rubber sex dolls in the United Kingdom, you have no right to prevent their importation from Denmark. And so that was the end of the um, Customs Consolidation Act, 1876. It, it took a few years for the, for the authorities to accept the logic of that position, but the Porn Wars were put on notice in the Conegate case. Uh, and the reason why nowadays, if you want to, you can go and watch videos of the most extreme and appalling depravity is because our membership of the European Union makes it illegal for the authorities to stop the importation and sale of these items in the United Kingdom. Um, the David Cameron would like to impose a minimum price for alcohol. If he, if he ever introduced a bill into Parliament, it would go through like that. Because you know the kind of people who sit in the House of Commons. You've seen them. Yes. Oh, yes, well, they're, they're drunk and degenerates, as I said. Uh, they would pass it. They would pass it. And even if they were drunk at the time, they'd pass it. Uh, it can't go ahead because it would contravene European Union law. And you can see how effective our domestic institutions are when a left-wing pressure group called Hacked Off did this a few weeks ago and got itself a pretty cast-iron promise of a press uh, licensing law. You know, left to Parliament, we're going to get a press licensing law. Uh, it can be done in David Cameron's rather underhand way, or it can be done in the way that Labour and the Liberal Democrats want, but we're going to get a press licensing law, our first one in 300 years, and this will be used to censor the press. It may even be used to censor individual blogs. We don't know yet. It depends on who gets appointed to run it. And they will try to entrench it, won't they? So that you need a two-thirds majority of the House of Commons before it can be changed. Well. You can write to your MPs, you, you, can, you, you, you can go and lobby them, you can have a demonstration in Parliament Square. It doesn't matter. It's already been done. It's a done deal. The only thing that will stop this, or the only thing that will moderate it, is the judges using the Human Rights Act and European Union law. Um, they are the only people who have the power to stop this from just being rubber stamped into law. Now I said at the beginning that the European Union is a fig leaf for our ruling class and a shield for us. Um, I've explained how it's a fig leaf. The reason why it's a shield is because that is one of the prices, that, that is part of the price that our ruling class has to pay it needs this wonderful fig leaf, this way of legislating without any shadow of accountability. But it comes with um, a price, uh, and the price is that the British state is able to have a very large input into the kind of laws made in Brussels, but it must also accept, um, it must also accept other laws 
which it may not like very much, and it must, above all, accept the due process structures required by membership of the European Union. Now, if there were a revolution tomorrow, and I were to come to power as, well, let's suppose I were to come to power as the front man for a military coup, one of the first things I did would be to leave the European Union. It's obvious. The European Union gets in the way of, um, of repealing all manner of bad laws. It's another inconvenience, another foreign entanglement. I'd leave NATO, I'd leave the United Nations, I'd probably leave the International Postal Union, I don't know. Um, you leave the European Union because it is not in itself a libertarian institution. To that extent, yes, I'm a Eurosceptic, but you know, do we, you know, if there were a referendum tomorrow on our membership of the European Union, how then would you vote? Would you vote to leave the European Union and leave everything else in this country unchanged? By which I mean, would you vote to leave the European Union and subject yourself to an absolutely sovereign and unaccountable and unappealable um, House of Commons? I wouldn't. We, we must leave the European Union only if there is a chance of replacing it with something better, some better way of securing our lives, liberty, and property. Until then, I would say that, um, speaking objectively in the Marxist sense, the European Union is probably not such a bad thing for liberty. It has enabled the judges to work their constitutional revolution. It has forced politicians who, left to themselves, would probably have barcodes tattooed on our foreheads and on the spot castration for suspected sex offenders. It has forced these people to respect rules of due process that they otherwise would not. Uh, and so um, I am, I suppose I am a Eurosceptic. I, I actually don't know. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Is there any uh, questions or criticism of what Sean had to say? I mean, you're, 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 sure, you're exactly right on the end, which is your very late council to spend. We spent an hour going through, which is assuming we continue to leave. Well, 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 obviously, the anarcho capitalists in the room won't leave. They thought obviously talk necessarily. But assuming that, nevertheless, we continue to leave with some sort of democratic process, the answer is we must somehow find method of making sure our kind of people form the 300 and whatever it's required to form the majority. Because otherwise, it is, as you said, essentially a council of spare trusting to love that, I mean, it must never be just a holding operation while the judges of your sort just try and hold back what's going on. Hmm. Well, yes, of course, if we were to get, um, if we could get decent people into Parliament, then... Um, we wouldn't have the problem that I've described. But you know, we're not going to get our people into Parliament, are we? The, the whole electoral system in this country is effectively an oligarchy of trash. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what reforms you suggest to that system. We could have... Um, you know, what, what, what did the Liberals try to get two years ago? Uh, alternative vote, wasn't it? You, you can go through all these various alternative ways of electing people to Parliament, but you'll still get, um, you'll still get low-grade degenerates in because they run the whole political process. Uh, about the only way I can think of that would give us um, decent representative institutions would be to fill up the House of Commons by lot uh, in the same way as juries are filled up nowadays. And I don't mean that um, candidates should be allowed to submit their names for pulling out of a hat, because, again, the kind of people who'd want to get into Parliament and put their names forward would be the usual suspects. 
oh, there, there'd be a higher chance that ordinary, decent people can get in, but they still, you still have much the same. The only way to do it would be to point at people and say, you've been elected to Parliament for the next five years, you must turn up and vote. That's the only way I can think of that would give us decent representative institutions. Elections, no, no, we've tried those and they don't work. Sorry. So, uh, thank you very much, Sean. That's a fascinating account of how the judges have kept uh, parliamentary sovereignty uh, in check. Um, can I put to this, um, even if the European Union didn't exist, surely the judges would still have their legitimate authority and surely they would also re still retain their uh, high level of intelligence and creativity. They would be able to generate new strategies of keeping uh, you know, the parliament from becoming excessively powerful. They might, Ray, they might. What, what I'd say about this is that um, the whole modern structure of judicial review as it's emerged since the... Uh, the whole structure of judicial review as it's emerged since 2002 is a bit like uh, dental bridge work in your mouth. It's wonderful how they've spread this so far. But the point is, it, it is pl it, it, bridge work has to be planted somewhere into the bone. You, you need some attachment to, to the mouth. And the grounding of judicial review as it currently stands is our membership of the European Union. It is the Thorburn judgment in 2002 which gave the judges the, their, their right to strike down offending statutes or to threaten to strike down offending statutes. Um, as I said, the politicians had to accept this it was the best deal, it was the only deal on offer. If they, if they, if they had not accepted that, they would, they would have had to re-enact the European Communities Act 1972, which is not something even the Blair government would have wanted to, to go through with. Um, so the judges used a membership of the European Union as a way of entrenching their powers of review. Now, they, they, they might have found a different way without a membership of the EU, but the point is, that is what their current power rests on. And I would be very cautious about um, taking that basis away from them. Thank you. Uh, is the solution a written constitution for this country along the lines that they have in the United States? which is specifically designed to set limits on the power of the state? No, because um, whenever our people talk about a written constitution and bill of rights, the assumption is that we are the people who will be writing the constitution and bill of rights. Uh, and of course it would look something like the American one, but it would, be, um, it would take account of the ways the American state has found round those constitutional documents. But of course, we would not be allowed anywhere near the drafting of a Constitution and Bill of Rights for this country. Chil the Bill of Rights would give children the inalienable and enforceable right to an anti-racist education. Um, the environment would be given enforceable rights. If you can imagine the British ruling class given the power to rip up what remains of our constitutional structure and replace it with some of their own construction, um, you know, I really would leave the country. I'd go and live in Slovakia. I, I, I wouldn't stay a day longer. Um, but would it be the aim of a potential libertarian government were such a thing to arise? Oh, yes. If we, ever, if we ever got ourselves into power or into power with some coalition of associated forces, then of course we would impose a, a new constitutional settlement on the country. But let's be honest, that is not going to happen, is it? You know, um, we are not going to get a libertarian revolution. It may be that the current order of things will collapse. It, it, it is based on lies. Uh, and it may be that uh, the current order of things will not last much longer. But don't suppose it will be replaced by anything that is 
very influenced by us. It may be more liberal. It'll probably be rather less liberal. Uh, but uh, you know, do not do not give these people the opportunity to, to to write a new constitution for us. It'll be worse than what we have at the moment. I remember in the 1970s, uh, Milton Friedman and various other American libertarians wanted to call a constitutional convention to rewrite the constitution so that there would be um, a constitutional obligation to balance the budget. Uh, I remember Chris Tame was aghast at the idea of doing that because uh, you, you call a constitutional convention and you know who will be running it. Same in this country, you do not want these people to be given any more power over us than they have already. You say the judges are our only defenders there. What do you think about the policy, possibilities of jury, nullif jury nullification? Well, yes, of course, jury nullification is a wonderful thing, and it is completely legal in this country. Indeed, the rules are that if a defendant stands up and says, I call on the jury to acquit me in the face of the evidence, um, unlike in the United States, the judges in this country are required to explain in ordinary language to the jurors that they do indeed have the right to acquit in the face of the evidence. But uh, you know, the politicians don't like that. Over large parts of this country, the drug laws are effectively a nullity because juries will not convict. Uh, there are whole classes of crime which, sorry, there are, there are many criminal laws in this country which are unenforceable because juries will not convict. Um, but the politicians have an obvious answer to that. You simply make, um, you simply remove juries. And that is what they have been doing. But they want to... Uh, they want to make uh, petty theft triable by magistrates only. Either that, if, sorry. sometimes the politicians have been explicitly removing our right to trial by jury. What they mostly do, however, is to stack the, um, they stack the law so that no one will risk trial by jury. For, for example, if I, um, if I punch Nigel on the nose, I could let it be tried by the magistrates, in which case they could send me to prison for six months max, or I could demand on, I, I could insist on trial by jury, and a jury has the right to send me to prison for ten years for that. Uh, and there are many, many crimes in this country where if you choose a jury, you're likely to get off. But if you don't get off, you may go down for 5, 10, 15 years. Whereas if you plead guilty in front of the magistrates, it's a slap on the wrist. Uh, and so they're taking away trial by jury. It, it, it's not juries which will protect us unless the judges can suddenly perk up and, and, and find that we have a constitutional right to trial by jury. It's the judges who are the defenders of our lives, liberty and property at the moment. Not jurors, not politicians, not, uh, not the media, it's judges. Yes. Judges are made up of lawyers. Mm. Um, how come, I mean, I'm interested in jury notification because I know some in the States who campaigns on this issue. How come the how come more lawyers aren't presenting that to the, um, to the jury by saying, well, you could convict, or you could arrest <laughs> evidence to decide that the law is not fair, and so on. Why aren't the lawyers themselves presenting that? I don't know. Um, my you know, main. Yes, I know. Country. I don't know. <laughs> my main experience is of the civil law. Um, I have. Well, my, my sole experience of the criminal law is when I lied my head off in a magistrate's court some years ago to try and get off a speeding fine. And um, yes, I, I wet myself in the, in the box. There you are. I, uh, the, sorry. the maximum punishment that I could get was uh, six points and a thousand pounds. That was the absolute maximum punishment that I could get. I, um, 
I'm a person with a great deal of legal knowledge and legal experience. And I went into the witness box, took the oath, and I could feel a dribble of urine running down my legs. Now, um, when anyone goes on in a daily mailish fashion about how the system is stacked in favour of the criminal, we need to think about the rights of victims, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, I've always believed in due process of law and the presumption of innocence and, all, and the buyers in favour of the defendant, but I had, um, you know, a, a light came on, my, came on in my head five years ago when I had actual experience of the criminal law in action. And as I said, it was a pitiful little case in which the worst that could happen to me was six points and a thousand pound fine. Now, uh, when you have uh, an uneducated, when you have a poor and uneducated person on trial for something for which he may be sent to prison for life, you can uh, you know, I, I could see that th there is just so much to be said for the presumption of innocence, um, the, the rule against double jeopardy, the rule against hearsay, the, the general bias in favour of the defence. But uh, going, going back to juries, I have little experience of the criminal courts. A question I often ask is, um, in these cases where 89-year-old Catholic priests uh, um, are dragged off life support and sent to prison for 100 years because, they, uh, because they're accused of kiddie fiddling in 1946, um, a question I often ask is, why does the defence not simply stand up in court and address the jury and say, look, it's impossible after so long to say whether this person is telling the truth. We don't know what the facts are. It's not possible to say what the facts are. But let me put this to you. Anyone who has spent his entire life for the past 30, 40, 50, sometimes 60 years um, nursing this grudge but never bothering to bring it to the attention of the authorities is inherently an unreliable witness. And so I suggest that you should take no notice whatever of anything he said, you should acquit my client. Now, now, that strikes me as an absolutely reasonable argument. If, um, if you're in a jury and someone is accused of having molested a child one year ago, two years ago, three years ago, let's say even five years ago, um, there is a case to be answered there, let's say. But when someone is brought in, when someone is brought in, um, accused of having molested a middle-aged woman in 1972, what sort of witness is that woman? Why didn't she complain at the time? And. You know, I, I would say that any reasonable person should regard that kind of testimony as inherently suspect. Yet why, time after time, do juries convict these people? I don't know. Is it that the lawyers refuse to put that common sense case to the, um, to, to the jury? I, I just don't know. Yes. So, anyone else? <coughs> John? Um, just a guess on um, why lawyers don't go for jury nullification is that they wouldn't make themselves very popular with the judges and other members of the profession. Mm. If, uh, it would be seen to be undermining everybody where everybody's uh, bread and butter comes from. Yes. And, uh, and also, um, you know, just, just a, a dangerous sort of precedent. Where, where, where would we be if this carried on and all of these cases would start being thrown out? And then, yeah. Uh, just one other point, you said at one point at the beginning of your talk, the power grows out of the barrel of the gun. Um, this seems not really to be true because the, uh, the person who tells the troops what to do doesn't necessarily point a gun at them. He has an authority and that's where real power comes. As long as people regard you as the person who is in charge, you can tell everybody with their guns what to do with them. I do take your point, Jan, and I withdraw the, that comment in all its starkness. I think what I intended to say was that um, the European Union has no authority in this country 
the, sorry, the, Uni the European Union has no power in this country, A, because it has little moral authority, and B, because it has no means of physical coercion. I, I think that would be um, a better expression of what I had in mind. Yes, I do, I do take your point there. Yeah. Sorry to come back to this, but um, some years ago there was a case where a group of women destroyed some planes that were going to be sent to the Indonesian government. And I think there was a, that was a sort of case of jury notification, because they were denied and they did it, and the jury just quit. But that wasn't officially jury notification, that wasn't the defence arguing that you should quit anyway, because, what was it? I think was some, they, they put some case forward that, that these were going to commit an immoral act, so it was some address where they, they destroyed the planes. But it was a kind of jury notification because they were guilty and they were clearly guilty and the jury acquitted them anyway. Mm. Well, juries do acquit people in the face of the evidence. Um, th they do it officially in the sense that um, the, the defendant has called on them um, to ignore the evidence. But most of they just do it in the way they've always done it. They, they, they just decide that the person isn't guilty. Um, who was that person 30 odd years ago, that weird civil servant who um, tried to sit Margaret Thatcher up over the Belgrano? Um, got done for official no, secrecy. Clive Ponting, that's it, yes. He called on the jury to acquit him in the face of the evidence, and the jury did. The government's, the government's response to that acquittal was to pass a new official secrecy act, which, um, w which removed juries from the trials, of course. Oh, and, and to replace uh, official secrecy to a large extent with um, civil law confidentiality, which is decided by a judge sitting alone. So, so uh, jury nullification is important, but it is a right which the politicians can take away at any point, and something which they have been taking away. Um, you know, I come back to the main point of my talk, which is that the only break on the British state at the moment is the judges. They are imperfect. They have all sorts of agendas which are not the same as ours. But uh, for all their faults, for all their defects, the judges are the only hope we have at the moment of living in a reasonably constitutional state. And the judges draw a large amount of their of their limiting power from British membership of the European Union. Um, Bob? Sorry, Bob. Sorry, Bob. It's a sort of question at right angles. But there is another way of doing these things nowhere near obtaining, which is that you simply walk across the border of your little jurisdiction, it's about five miles away. And you enter another one. And there are no powers of extradition. Well, there might be, for certain crimes, perhaps. There wouldn't be a power of extradition, you would simply be bundled back over the border if it was proof that you were a murderer or a rapist or whatever. But the idea that you, you might not have to rely upon the judges, you could simply, the people would simply choose to have a different set of laws by moving themselves, or dismaying the laws, or having a different enforcement agency, and judges come with it. I mean, it hasn't, hasn't got to be spelled out. We just don't do it. That's daft. We don't do that. What's that? Is it yours? Don't touch it. Don't touch that man. There's a lot of really simple respect for one another, and the law is made far too important, in a way, is what I'm getting to here. Simple decency and respect and productivity makes for a, a better world than a more perfect uh, legal system, perhaps, is what I'm trying to say. Mm. You may not dispute this. But... Oh, no, of course I do. Uh, uh, you know, of course I agree with you. Um, at the same time, I would say that um, we do not live in a normal country. We live in a country where the people in positions of formal authority uh, appear to have gone barking mad. And there is no other restraint on their actions but judges empowered by the European Union. And so I'm afraid that uh, we, should you know, we should pay a great deal more attention than we so far have to what the judges are doing. In a normal world, 
In a normal world, you could pass through your entire day without coming face to face with the British state, but I'm afraid we don't live in any kind of normal world. Yeah, no. um, it appears as if judges are a very good target for our message. How can we make our message more accessible to judges? Good question, I don't know. Uh, sorry, sorry I, I tend to, sorry, um, I won't say that Nigel, Nigel Meek uh, switched a light on my head last year when he published his book, but um, he does give chapter and verse to something which I've long suspected, which is that libertarianism in this country is an insignificant force. We are of no, we are of no political or intellectual weight whatsoever. And um, the, the idea that we could force ourselves, force ourselves into the presence of the higher judiciary and convert them to libertarianism is, um, it's nice, but not very likely. Um, I, I think all we can do is to keep insisting as loud as we can that the authorities should obey their own laws. They should obey their own rules. Mm -hmm. uh, we should also make it quite plain that um, if there should be a revolution in which we find ourselves in charge of things, we will not be bound by their rules. One of the... Um, I keep coming back to it. Uh, I, I keep coming back to my discontent with your average Eurosceptic. The idea is that um, the ancient constitution still does exist and can be easily restored as soon as we leave the European Union and cut down a bit on the taxes and spending side of things. Well, no, the, the old constitution has gone and we as libertarians and conservatives should not feel committed um, emotionally to the preservation of the existing order of things. If we ever find ourselves in a position of authority, we should not behave unjustly, we should not behave in a violent or an arbitrary manner, but in our reconstruction of the constitutional order, we should not consider ourselves bound by the current order of things. But those people who are committed to the current order of things and those people who benefit from its continuance should be um, very loudly reminded at all times of their obligation to work according to their own rules. That's a long-winded answer to your question, I must confess. Uh, but I, I don't think we have much chance of bringing the judges over to anarcho-capitalism by sending them our blog postings or our longer publications. Um, but I think we can just loudly insist that uh, these people should follow their own rules. John? i just point out that we have a member uh, whom we should probably not name, who is a QC and might well become a judge one day, and who calls himself uh, a libertarian anarchist. So, uh, it is possible to have some influence, and that's the best route is if you really want to influence the judge, judges, become a judge. Anybody can pass the barrister exam, uh, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lucrative, um, corrupt route. So, <laughs> you, you, you might do well out of it at the same time. Yes. If our mutual friend does become a judge, I will, of course, rejoice, along with everybody else. But um, it's one among many. And in the 1980s, we'd, you know, we, we had... Um, sorry, we do at the moment have former communists on the bench. Is it Mr. Justice Sedley? I think he used to be a member of the Communist Party. And in the 1980s, there were various low-level judges who had been very, very left-wing in the 1940s. 
but, but the extremes tend not to influence the overall policy of the mass. So are we done? Well, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Oh.